do I fall in love with every woman I see who shows me the least bit of attention? Hey, what's up everyone? It's Ryan here from The Y, and today we're going to be taking a look at the romantic sci-fi drama, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. In my mind, one of the best parts about the film is the premise. It's something we can all relate to. Getting your heart broken absolutely sucks. But what if there was a procedure that could take away all that pain in an instant? The movie also contained two of the best performances of Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet's careers, which is ironic considering both played roles opposite of ones they're usually typecast in. With that in mind, here are 30 facts you didn't know about Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. The movie Memento nearly killed production of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind while it was still in the writing phase. Memento was released in the year 2000, at which time Charlie Kaufman was hard at work finishing the script to the romantic sci-fi drama. The film, which similarly dealt with memory, started to gain a ton of recognition, causing Kaufman to freak out quite a bit. He voiced his concern to Gondry, who agreed that the concept was much too alike, and that both of them decided to call up producer Steve Golan to say that they were out of the project. Thankfully, Golan was able to be the voice of reason and got the two back on track. I ditched work today. I don't know why. I'm not an impulsive person. As the film was made in the early 2000s, Nicolas Cage was at the prime of his career and was actually Michel Gondry's first choice to play Joel. However, things didn't work out as Cage was simply in too high demand and decided to work on another film. Because of the fact that the movie was shot out of chronological order, Kate Winslet was forced to wear wigs to achieve Clementine's different hair colors. Hair dye wasn't really an option, as some days called for multiple hair color changes. But in the end, it didn't matter too much, as the wigs looked pretty damn convincing in my opinion. Kate Winslet said her favorite wig had to be the red one, and she even considered dyeing her hair red because she loved the look so much. When Joel says this line, Sorry, I thought there was more. This is a reference to the fact that the Lacuna staff drank a bunch of his liquor the night he got the procedure done. The idea for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind came about in the year 1998 from conceptual artist Pierre Bismuth. Bismuth was friends with director Michel Gondry and mentioned the thought he had about erasing people from memories. He had gotten the idea from a friend who was complaining about her boyfriend, which prompted Bismuth to pose the question to her, if you could erase him from your memory, would you? And she replied yes. Bismuth discussed the idea further with Gondry and informed him of his plan to send out cards to people, mentioning they'd been erased from the memory of someone they thought they knew. The thought experiment never exactly came to fruition, but Michel Gondry loved the concept so much, he enlisted the help of Pierre Bismuth and writer Charlie Kaufman to turn the idea into the story we know today. Who wants to spend that much time with someone and to find out that she's a stranger? On a podcast, Kate Winslet was asked what her favorite role of all time was. Without hesitation, Winslet replied that it had to be Clementine from Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. She explained how after Titanic, and playing the role of the in-your-face leading lady who was looking immaculate all the time, Winslet was reminded of how that wasn't her. The six or seven years that followed was a period of rediscovery for Winslet, and taking on small parts that barely got any recognition finally culminating in the role of a lifetime in Clementine. Jolie? Yeah, Tangerine. Am I ugly? In a strange twist of fate, after watching Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Kanye West was so entranced by the soundtrack of the film that he immediately got in touch with the composer, John Brion. Brion had never done any work related to hip hop, but nonetheless, following an afternoon of recording together with Kanye, their working relationship was set in stone. The result of this unlikely pairing between West and Brion helped create the album Late Registration, and more specifically, the song Gold Digger. The name Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was taken from the 1717 poem Eloise to Abelard, and during the course of the film, Mary actually recites four lines from the poem, one of which is obviously the inspiration for the title of the film. How happy is the blameless vessel's lot, the world forgetting by the world forgot, eternal sunshine of a spotless mind, each prayer accepted, and each wish resigned. This scene foreshadows the romantic relationship between Mary and Dr. Howard. This is a hoax, right? 
And this is Clinton. I assure you, no. No. Every director in filmmaking has their own way of doing things, and one tactic Gondry used that really set him apart was giving the cast improv notes to try and spice up certain scenes. One such part that had a little bit of spice added in extra was the first meeting between Clem and Joel, as her punching him was not in the script at all. Hey. Oh, hey. Take care then. Jesus. With the title like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, there's no chance in hell you're gonna be able to translate that word for word to another language. Because of this, foreign titles for the movie were all over the place, leading to many audiences who were confused as to what kind of movie it even was. Two of the best titles came from Italy and Spain, with the Italian title translating to, If you leave me, I delete you, while the Spanish one read, Forget about me. The color of Clementine's hair serves as a symbol for the current stage of her relationship with Joel, told through the four seasons. At the end of the film, we're finally shown the first time that Joel and Clementine truly met. It happened on the beach and Clementine's hair was green. Specifically, the name of the hair dye is Green Revolution, and it serves as a symbol for spring, the season most notably associated with birth and prosperity. The next stage of the relationship is of course the honeymoon phase, and Clementine's hair signifies this change with a switch to red. The actual name of the hair dye is Red Menace, a reference to the passion between Joel and Clementine during their bright summer of love. Next is the turning point in the relationship, as tensions begin to flare and it's clear that Clementine is beginning to pull away. This time she changes the color of her hair to orange, a sign that the summer of love is over and that autumn has arrived. In many ways, fall is synonymous with decay and decline, as leaves inevitably begin to lose their hue and fall to their death. If that wasn't enough, Clementine's hair color is aptly named Agent Orange, a highly toxic herbicide used in the Vietnam War. And finally, blue is the last hair color Clementine is seen with, a color most people connect with winter. It's the perfect season to describe the phase of the relationship that the two are in. Which is to say, it's non-existent. Dead. Just like the dead of winter where nothing grows. This is where the name of the hair dye, Blue Ruin, which means complete and utter ruin or desolation, makes a lot more sense. Joel and Clementine had already broken up during this period of time, but a funny thing happens at the end of the film. They meet once again and decide to start over. Looking at this through the scope of winter, this can be seen as the winter solstice, an event that is symbolic of rebirth and new beginnings. One part that never made the final cut was a sex scene between Mark Ruffalo and Kirsten Dunst. Runtime was the deciding factor in cutting it out, but at least we got a better scene of them dancing over Jim Carrey, which was totally improvised. Another scene that never quite saw the light of day was a montage of people who wanted to erase traumatic memories from their past. This included a soldier who saw his friends die in war, and a woman who was sexually abused as a child. In my opinion, it honestly would have been pretty interesting to see the wide scope of reasons why people would want their memories erased, but in the end, it was deemed too unrelated from the story of Joel and Clem. For the scene where Stan scares Mary, oh my God, Stan! Michelle Gondry told Ruffalo to hide in a different spot every take in order to actually scare her. Speaking on improvisation in his films, Michelle Gondry said, it keeps you on your toes, it makes everybody work faster with more energy. So as you can tell, the cast members were encouraged to improvise and add comedy wherever they saw fit. This was the case for all the cast members except one, Jim Carrey. Because of the character he portrays in the film, Carrey was forced to stick to the script and remain unspontaneous, just like Joel. Gondry even remembers how he used to tell Kate Winslet, go as big as you want, this is a comedy. While to Jim Carrey he'd say, this is a drama, not a comedy. As you can tell, to say that Jim Carrey was frustrated would be a massive understatement. In the movie, Joel makes this claim about women he doesn't know. Seeing that I'm incapable of making eye contact with a woman I don't know. But when he meets Clementine again, after already having his memory of her wiped, he makes eye contact with her, potentially hinting that his memory of her wasn't completely gone. 
the original screenplay had a very different beginning and ending that took place 50 years in the future. It began with Mary as an old woman walking into an office trying to get a manuscript published. They basically refuse to see her, and it's revealed that the manuscript is titled Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a tell-all about Lacuna. At the end of the screenplay, it's shown that Mary still works for Dr. Howard, although it seems as if any romantic or even friendly feelings she had towards the man are all but gone. And things aren't much better with Joel and Clementine, as we find out that over the past 50 years, they've both had each other erased over 15 times. Definitely a much more depressing conclusion to the film. Due to personal preference, Michel Gondry tried to use as few special effects as possible for the film. One scene you may be surprised to hear had no digital effects is the flashback with Joel as a little kid under the table. To get the shot they wanted without any fancy behind the scenes editing, the filmmakers employed the use of forced perspective, thereby making Joel appear much smaller than in actuality. Lighting is an important tool which adds to the feel and tone of any movie, and for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Gondry wanted to employ as much natural light as possible. This request proved extremely challenging for cinematographer Ellen Kuros, so in an attempt to preserve the natural light while also making it bright enough to be viewable, she hid light bulbs inside pieces of furniture to achieve the desired effect. The classic scene of Joel and Clementine laying down on the frozen lake may have not happened if the weather hadn't been right. The script had always called for snow and ice, but Gondry was prepared to omit such details and film the scene a different way if the weather wouldn't cooperate. Thankfully, New York had a winter that year more than cold enough to freeze the lake over, and the rest is history. One funny thing to note is that some critics thought the crack in the ice was symbolic of their fractured relationship but Gondry simply said he put the actors next to it so the ice wouldn't look fake. During the first meeting between Joel and Clementine on the train, the music was originally supposed to fill the gap during the silent moments between the two. It was only after Charlie Kaufman suggested the opposite, that music be played when Joel and Clementine talked, and then paused when they paused, that things were changed. My name is Clementine, by the way. I'm Joel. Hi, Joel. As Charlie Kaufman was the person who wrote both Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and Being John Malkovich, he initially put the Lacuna office inside the same building as the one in Being John Malkovich. In the end, the setting didn't fit with what Gondry had in mind, but it would have been a cool easter egg. It's one thing to make a film like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, but to actually live it is a different beast altogether. This was the case for director Michel Gondry, who said that during post-production, his girlfriend at the time unexpectedly left him. The experience left Gondry in a world of hurt, and even made his own film unwatchable because it was simply too sad to bear. But maybe this was all a bit of karma coming back to bite him in the ass. Jim Carrey recalled his first meeting with Michel Gondry about starring in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Carey was going through a rough patch at the time, as he had recently broken up with Renee Zellweger and was absolutely heartbroken. He recalled how Gondry told him, You are so beautiful right now. You are so broken. Please, don't get well. And that wasn't all. Carey also believed that Gondry hired Ellen Pompeo to play Joel's ex-girlfriend Naomi intentionally. Why? Carey said Ellen Pompeo and Renee Zellweger had a striking resemblance to each other, and he believed it was a ploy by Gondry to elicit some type of emotional response. Michel Gondry responded to his accusations and said, I don't think they look alike, but I'm inclined to believe Carey, partly because it's just a better story. Although the movie itself can be described as bittersweet at best, the ending was actually somewhat optimistic, with the two deciding to give it another go. And this is especially true when you take a look at two other proposed endings that had much darker undertones. One idea was to have Joel walk away at the end and not give them another chance, while the second was a bit more out there and involved a big reveal that the whole movie had taken place in Clementine's head. Unlike many directors, Gondry hated using the word action to begin a scene. He explained how as soon as he would say the word, everybody would become a piece of wood. And then magically, once he said cut, the opposite happens and everything becomes alive and fluid. So to get around this problem, Gondry would simply start filming without warning and let the actors decide when to go. 
The scene in which Joel and Clementine go to the parade was all totally improvised. It just happened that the casting crew were working nearby, and Gondry decided it could fit well into the movie. The scene also contains one of Gondry's favorite moments in the film, the part where Clementine suddenly disappears, as Jim Carrey was totally unaware that Gondry had told Kate Winslet to sneak away. Clementine. In the movie, we hear about Joel's ex Naomi. Naomi, but we're not really, I mean, we're. But we never actually see her. However, at first, this wasn't the case, as the character of Naomi was originally played by Ellen Pompeo before producers decided to cut out the four scenes that she was in. This development was actually fairly significant, as the deletion of Naomi changes how the character of Joel is presented. Let me explain. In chronological order, the first deleted scene takes place right before the party on the beach. Nothing much happens and we find out that she didn't attend because of work. Have fun. Get laid. Just kidding. The next clip happened sometime after Joel and Clementine's first meeting on the beach, and he tells Naomi that things just aren't working out as they are both unhappy. She immediately smells his bullshit and asks who he met. Bullshit. Who is it? You met someone. Although he denies meeting anyone else. It's not somebody else. It's not. This is where things get interesting. Two years later, after his relationship with Clementine had run its course, and the night before he gets his memory erased, Joel goes on a date with Naomi. You haven't been with anyone in all this time? <sighs> it's been a lonely couple of years, really. I don't even know what happened. After, as you know, he goes through with the procedure, wakes up the next day, meets Clementine on the train, and they fall for each other once again, with Clementine writing her number down before he leaves. And here we come to the final deleted scene. The movie would have us believe that Joel calls Clementine the minute he gets in the door, but this deleted clip shows that he in fact calls Naomi first. She tells him what a good time she had on their date, and Joel basically says he doesn't want to see her again, but in an indirect Joel kind of way. Considering the, the problems we had, you know? I said earlier that these deleted scenes change the way that Joel's character is presented, and it's true. The final version of the film presents Joel as a depressed, hopeless romantic with barely a mention of Naomi, but add in those extra scenes and it becomes apparent that he straight up left Naomi for Clementine and didn't even have the balls to tell her the truth. No, I just need some space maybe. Not only that, the deleted scenes also take away a lot of the romantic vibes felt in that phone call between Joel and Clem, as he had just spoken to Naomi a minute earlier. So it's clear that the parts with Naomi in them did no favors for Joel and his likability, but the same goes for Clementine. With the addition of Naomi and her personality, which can be described as the exact opposite of Clementine's, I believe this stark contrast makes it a lot easier to spot the flaws in Clementine's behavior. Against the backdrop of Naomi's more relaxed, logical, and level-headed personality, all the endearing qualities these of Clementine take on a more toxic feel. If you were to add all the deleted scenes into the movie, it almost seems as if Naomi was the more reasonable and in some ways better choice for Joel. But Clementine represented excitement, risk, and plunging into the unknown. So by removing the character of Naomi, it shifts the focus away from the question of did Joel make the right choice, and puts the spotlight entirely on the whirlwind romance between Joel and Clementine. I could die right now, Clementine. Ellen Pompeo's Naomi wasn't the only character who was cut from the movie, as Tracy Morgan also had a part that didn't make the final cut. Morgan was set to play Joel's neighbor and would have been in a couple flashback scenes, but ultimately Gondry felt that Tracy Morgan was just basically playing himself, which meant that anyone who knew him would have just been distracted during those flashbacks. In 2016, it was announced that the producer of the original film, Steve Golan, was going to be remaking the classic movie into a TV show. Since that piece of news came out, it's been over five years with no new information, so who knows if it's still happening or not. But in my opinion, let the film be a standalone piece. Not everything needs to be remade. But what are your guys' thoughts on this? Should they remake this into a TV show or not? Thank you for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave me a like and don't forget to subscribe. Alright, till next time, have a great day.